Here we go. podcast for the week ending December 6th, 2019. That's the first time I had a chance to say that this year. This is episode 298 where we talk about all things smart controls and all really cool events like the one that's coming up. So to help me with this, let's bring on your host and mine for the first time in 2019. The man, the myth, the legend, the one, the only. He's not getting older. He's getting better. Kenny Smyers the control man from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Kenny, welcome to the show, big dog. Well, thank you very much, Eric. Uh, Well, you just, you've blown so much smoke on me. I I don't know where to go, but uh, straight ahead, look at the camera and smile. Uh, Welcome to 19, you know, 2019. It's going to be a great year. We've already got, you know, so many uh, episode uh, events and things happening and and we're just in full flux for the show. Uh, It's, I can, I'm happy to report that today was another successful day. Everything's falling and, 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 in favor of the Control Trends Awards. This weather is going to be fabulous. It's going to be a sunny day, uh, high of 45 degrees, and, and uh, it should be great travel for people coming to the show. A sold uh, out show. Sold oh, it's, it's out, it, sold and, you know, out and, and as, as we mentioned, it's unfortunate that the, uh, there's very, there's not going to be any empty, or there's not going to be any open room, any seats, and, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm concerned that, you know, we've made, um, m- the appeal for us to have a Control Trends Award show has come through the sponsors as being basically the caretakers and the stewards of the tickets because of, of just the way the control shows set up. Maybe next year in Orlando we can sell individual tickets and people can come in and sit in general seating. But the, you know this thing set up as a banquet and it's a very head count event. It's like a wedding. Everything is, is now it's precision. And, and so it's, um, we apologize. It's top, top hat. It's top hat, baby. The reason it's that way is because we have great food, great drinks, great entertainment. All the superstars are going to be there. If you don't, haven't connected with a sponsor yet, that's the way to get in the show. Some of our sponsors might still have tickets. So platinum sponsors like Honeywell, Johnson, Siemens, you can reach out to those folks. The platinum sponsors are on the right-hand side of the Control Trends website. Belimo, Kelly, uh, you know, and then we got gold sponsors. Uh, and, and so there's a lot of tickets out there, but they just need, you need to kind of, you know, marry up to the uh, person that you do your business right. with. And, and, and make sure you can always go to StubHub.com. I understand they're going for about 1500 bucks a piece on StubHub. <laughs> Just nah. teasing about that. But but Kenny, listen, uh, sort of a detail for our audience, you know, me being from Atlanta, I sort of have an inside track on this. The Fox Theater is not far at all from where you're probably staying, right? It's it, it's what they call Midtown Atlanta, which is a couple of clicks north of downtown Atlanta and the event site. So everybody in Atlanta knows the Fox Theater. So my advice to you is to get to the show. Just get in an Uber. Tell them you want to go to the Fox Theater. That's all you have to do. Right. And there's an address. There's two physical addresses that you may have seen in correspondence from us. But the 660 Peachtree Street, Northeast, Atlanta, Georgia, 30308. That's 660 Peachtree Street, Northeast, Atlanta, Georgia. But as Eric said, the Fox Theater, every cab driver, every Uber driver, everybody in Atlanta is going to take you to the right place. Right. And so, Kenny, what, what, what time do the doors open? Let's, let's talk our people through what's going to happen on Sunday night. I'd love to, Eric. Uh, the Easy I.O. event will be from 5.30 to 6.30. And that'll be in the um, – it'll be in an antechamber. Ante- it'll be in a grand salon right in, uh, next to in front of the Egyptian ballroom. The actual event is in the Egyptian ballroom, and, and that begins at uh, – the doors will open there at 6.15. So, um, you know, we, we'll accommodate as many early birds as possible. And, and we always welcome people to be in uh, early because then we can get a process. Uh, you know, we're going to have 340 people uh, and we're going to have to, you know, in process them as well as possible uh, at the time 
we, we've made yeah. provisions for them, but uh, it's exciting because yeah. we're going to have a red carpeted area and uh, we're, we're going we're to have some really neat things to look at on the way into the show. But I think what we've said, uh, and we're going to encourage everybody is once you get in, uh, grab a drink at the bar and find your seats. Uh, Sit and, down, and, yeah. Because yeah. the show's going to start, uh, they're going to start seeing uh, music that's going to start being played, you know, right away. Six fifteen. Right, right. And even though we got a full crowd, this is a very spacious area. So you're not going to be crowded. You're going to be super comfortable. I mean, visually, the Egyptian ballroom is absolutely stunning. It, it, it's like, so you're going to step back in time and history. It, uh, it, it, it's, it's one of the most beautiful spaces we've had. So it's going to be great. I, I would say uh, if you're, Thinking about going to the EZIO event and you're not, you haven't already told them, you need to reach out to Gina Elliott because that is by invitation only. And I'm sure they'd be willing to invite you, but they will be checking people at the door and uh, to get into their events. So anyway, enough of that, Kenny. It's going to be a great show. And I tell you what, anything else before we bring our guest on? No, uh, please visit uh, the, the website, controltrends.com or .org. Uh, we've got some great posts, but uh, the emphasis will be on our guests because we've got a very interesting uh, lineup of uh, questions and answers. Uh, to right. and, and it's kind of like the dynamic duo from Canada. They're kind of like Batman and Robin. They're kind of like uh, Spider-Man and Superman, right? So without <laughs> further ado, bring the dynamic duo on, if you will. Kenny. All right. We have Ken St. Clair, the owner editor of Automated Buildings, and we have Brad White, president of SES Consulting. Welcome to the show, guys. Welcome to the show, guys. Thank you very much. Thanks. Well, Brad, it's been a while since we've seen you. You know, we've been keeping up with Ken for, for some time, but uh, tell our community a little bit about what you've been up to outside of uh, straight in Parliament out in Canada. What, what else have you been doing? Well, I've mostly been uh, you know, trying, trying to change the world uh, one, one project at a time up here, but really, um, you know, big focus on, um, you know, get, getting, getting things going with, uh, we're, we're doing a big push up here in uh, electrification. So converting, trying to convert all of our buildings away from natural gas and other carbon emitting um, fuels over to our abundant clean electricity. So that's, uh, that, that's one thing we've been uh, really focusing on. And of course, always you know, trying, to, trying to bring the, uh, the advanced controls along with it. How's that going? I, I'm curious. I mean, the, the right away, that throws a question in my mind. Uh, it, not, it's got to be a straight uphill uh, battle, isn't it? Or is it are people receptive to changing over to electrification versus... You know, you, you know, there's there's been uh, you know two or three years ago, if you had asked me that question, I would say, yeah, we've got a we've got a huge hill to climb. Uh, no question, there's there's still a, a a big uphill climb, but uh, definitely a lot more a lot more folks receptive to it. Cool. A lot, a lot of clients, that. public and private sector, coming to us now and saying, hey, we, we're we're interested in in doing something about our carbon emissions, and that's well, been a real change. And, and you know, I'm big, you know, great for us. It's, it's it's been one of our one of our core values for a long time. Well, that's fantastic. Fantastic. And uh, Elon Musk has got to be a big fan of that. So he's, he's got to be a poster child for you guys, right? <laughs> I, yeah, got to, got to love, got to love the stuff that he's doing. Now, listen, before we get started, and I hope this won't influence how the, the, the temperament of this call goes, but do you know that uh, Ken Sinclair has been saying you're no longer a young gun, you're too old to be a young gun? <laughs> Emeritus. Yeah. <laughs> Well, you know what? When I, I was I was actually having this this conversation early, earlier today um, with someone, but I, I you know look around at some of our, our employees now, and I'm like, oh, there's there's more than a few years now between me and some of the folks that we're hiring, and uh, it, it was only a good worse. <laughs> it was a good decade now or, or so, more. So, so uh, you know what? I'm 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 right there with you guys. I think so, that so, the, so. Young, the, the young guns thing is not. Uh, not necessarily the, the best title for me anymore. No, no. It wasn't, wasn't a guarantee. Yeah, you're a millennial, <laughs> and I think we got the many millennials, so we'll have to start talking about how to handle the many millennials from a millennial's perspective. So, yeah, Totally. <laughs> well, all right, Ken Sinclair, uh, January issue's out. Uh, tell our community a little bit about what's in the January issue. Well, it's all about open, and uh, open 2019, and we're basically – looking that uh, everything is moving towards open. Uh, as Brad mentioned, he's going to have some uh, uh, sessions at uh, AHR. Uh, we're just seeing a big change in the world. We're starting to see 
uh, all of the majors are starting to acknowledge that open exists and uh, we're starting to see uh, the, the more more than majors I guess the Googles and the uh, Amazons are struggling as to what their definition of open is and uh, basically throwing sand in each other's gears trying to become the dominant uh, open uh, platform for us all so it's it's an interesting time uh, very interesting so the open proprietary platform is that what they're fighting over I think so which which of course yeah that, that exactly an open proprietary platform <laughs> yes that's exactly it except uh, they amazingly a stuff amazingly enough some of this stuff actually does work with each other and uh, we're getting crossover and we're getting uh, people who basically zip out and through some open software come back in again and uh, have circumvented uh, the sand that they attempted to put in their gears. So it's it's kind of fun stuff for sure. Well, I think as it applies to our industry, uh, it's always fun to see your your theme and, and, and some of the things you say because uh, you're one of the few people in the position that has the uh, you know the experience and really knows the inside of the the development of our industry and how it progressed and how certain barriers were put into place and finally they were overcome and then another barrier was put into place. And the idea is, of course, for a manufacturer that, that invests all their money uh, you know, and, and they handle uh, and, and control the sale of, of as much product and, and software as they can for as long as they can. Hence the, uh, the, the, the transition into, uh, you know, the protocol, uh, proprietary protocols into the backnet proprietary protocols into the backnet open to the BLT backnet version so that we finally started getting some real instances of open uh, components. And then we saw the, uh, of course, the Swiss Army Life of, of, of framework was the Niagara framework that came out. And since the Fort New Niagara 4 really took openness to a new level. And, um, but I think, you know, there's still uh, a, a significant amount of important vendors that will not go willingly into that open night you know they're just they're gonna they're gonna do everything they can to maintain a proprietary hold now branches being one one entity and and other uh, entities you know other manufacturers um do you really think that uh, this being 2000 2019 do you think we'll see them uh you know come into the open world uh, willingly or only still reluctantly uh, as has been the, the case in the past I see it uh, as because I'm the old man in the room, I guess, and like you say, I've seen, seen, seen this all happen before. It to me, it doesn't look hardly any different at all than the transition from pneumatics to DDC. Uh, basically, the majors dragged their feet until they were forced by the DDC contractors to uh, to basically come around and. Uh, uh, this was an actual serious technology and they had to get involved. So they ended up buying companies and uh, moved into that transition. Then we had the back net open. It was the same thing. They were not leaders in that. They all dragged their feet until the uh, independents basically made uh, the back net open work. And once they did that and started getting market share, they were forced to basically open up to back net and, sort of support it, uh, although even now they're still not really good supporters of it. And then of course the next uh, uh, step in that was basically the moving of IT to all of this. And uh, it's been the same thing. It's been a, a fight. They've been basically struggling. And uh, I thought it was interesting in uh, one of the interviews that uh, Brad did with uh, his, his folks on his panel they brought up the 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 words proprietary dragons and i thought that was pretty funny so you basically have these proprietary dragons and they've got their uh, their universities and their hospitals and their stuff behind them and as soon as these uh, open independents come they breathe on them but the problem is is they've got uh, these dragons have uh, bigger dragons breathing on their trail on their tails and uh, and this is what's sort of happening with Google and Amazon and uh, uh, a bunch of other open uh, movements are starting to, uh, you know, starting to come. I think what's happened, just like in those other industries, 
we learn from home. It's always kind of funny that uh, we learn how to do our job from home. And it's the same thing. Our phones have become so powerful and they do so many things and they cross so many platforms that we ask our vendors to do that. And within their proprietary uh, realm, they can't do it because they just cannot develop software that fast and products and stuff. So they're limited. And uh, um, Brad points out in his, uh, his interview this month, he talks about that for some of his smaller clients, he's, he's mobilized. They want, uh, you know, $50,000 to add uh, a stat pack to their uh, proprietary system. And so he basically does some guerrilla warfare with open systems and uh, is able to, you know, to work around. Yeah, and so anyway, well, I, I don't no, see it as a big difference than, than when, what we yeah. had through all of those other iterations of DDC, uh, BACnet, IT. Uh, right. it's, it's just another stage. Well, I, I want to ask Brad a question uh, in, in a second, but I, I want to make a comment. There's a really something very ironic here, because if you think about the only true open system that we ever had was pneumatics. And how did people compete back in the days of pneumatics, right? Because it was, you know, air was the network and you could mix and match, but yet they all managed to compete back then. So it seems like we've gone away from truly open once the DDC came around, but that being said, Brad, when you talk to your clients, uh, how educated are they on open and how do you as a consultant guide them so they get truly opened and not get dragoned? Um, I would say that generally they're not that well educated on it. I mean, they know about BACnet. Um, we've got a big, a big support for BACnet here with the, the vendors locally. So. Yeah, that that's been a thing for a while and, and most of our clients know enough to know okay what, whatever we have has got to be back net it's open protocols but beyond that um you know not really any awareness of the new like called the new open so you're talking about actually truly open source um hardware and software that, that is you know multi-vendor and, and open to anyone i would say there's almost zero awareness of that among our clients does that make your job harder then um, I mean, I just don't talk about it that way. Um, wow. so, <laughs> um, rather than trying to educate them about open, it's more about, well, this, this is what we want to do. We're going to use an open solution to do that. This is why it's to your advantage because then we don't have to spend $50,000 on buying a proprietary solution when we can do it for, for a couple thousand with an open solution and it will get you, you know, what you need for, for this job. And, and so, you know, it's kind of talked about it in a way that, that sort of emphasizes the benefits to them and why they want to do it. I mean, they, at the end of the day, they don't really care about the philosophy of open. You know, that doesn't matter to them as much as, you know, what they actually get out of it on, on a, pro a project by project basis. Well, if we uh, continue on this path, we're going to bog ourselves into, a, you know, a, a just, it, it's like pulling the rope. But I, I think 2019, I think Ken St. Clair uh, says in his editorial, and, and it, this is going to be, and Mark Petock reiterated too, this is a year of change. This is a year we're going to see much more advanced adoption of technology or the implementation of technology versus you know, I think people, this is a transition point or a tipping point or, or what do you call it, uh, whatever point you want to do, inflection point. But we're going to see things happening because, as Ken, you say in your next thing, uh, we open to growing younger because we're seeing a transition of the people controlling our industry. The baton's passing back to people that just simply can't, they can't, uh, you know, they can't comprehend a closed system, you know, because so much of what they want to do and so many of the, the technology gains and benefits are tied into an open, you know, open environment. Let's speak to your, uh, how can we be open growing younger comment? Well, actually, I was just going to interrupt Brad, as, but I always do that so often. I, I decided to hold, hold <laughs> quiet this time. But actually, when, when I, I was watching the consulting firm from afar, <clears throat> not far enough for their point of view, but from afar. And uh, I was worried that they didn't know any of the neat stuff that I knew. And I was wondering how they were going to put this all together. And the answer is they did it their way. And it is completely different than anything I ever imagined. And open to them is just another tool 
and they know how to use open. Uh, they probably don't know as well as I did how to use some of these proprietary systems. And uh, I think, I think in that point of view, it became an advantage. And so what I see them is I see them huddling and I see them sharing ideas and going new directions. Uh, uh, I find it very exciting to look through their eyes and, and I can almost grasp what they're talking about. But it's because they grew up in a digital age and they, they, did, they don't have, their mind's not plugged up with pneumatics, DDC systems and uh, Fortran and all the things that we had to do to get where we are. There's nothing uh, for them to unlearn, huh? Pardon? Yeah. <laughs> to forget it and, and... But the, the biggest thing of, of looking through your younger mentor's eyes is that you can quickly unlearn that. Unlearn is probably not uh, the best word, but detach from all of your experience and slip into a digital world and just see how they look at it. Just watch how they use their phones. Watch how they how they interact with each other. Watch how whoa, they. Whoa, whoa, whoa! Hang on a second. Yeah, they don't interact with each other anymore. My wife. If I want to talk to her, I have to text her. Come on now. I mean, <laughs> isn't 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 that an interaction? Well, it is. It, not the kind that I'm kind of going for, but it is. An <laughs> But it but it ends it ends that whole she said he said because it's all it's all we can always just read the the text Ken, string. Ken, you've been married a long time. You know it never ever ends the he said she said. <laughs> it's always <laughs> the she said, right? So all right. Well, no, I, I, I get your point. And uh, so the 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 interesting aspect is, as Brad mentioned, uh, the, the you, you're trying to change your environment. You're trying to go from you know dependency on fossil fuels and, and, and all the negative externalities that causes. Uh, you got some great uh, you know, movement and, and adoption of electrification of Canada. And then you work it uh, through your new systems that when you get a chance to put an open system together, it results in the latest technology at a lower price. How, how, how's that package, do uh, you think, going to be adopted across North America? In other words, not to start a problem with vendors or whatever, but, you know, that clearly flies in kind of a, I don't want to say in contrary to the way our business is, our business model is established now. How, how do you take that platform on a, on a national basis? Or is that kind of like a one on a one to one or, you know, maybe a city by city. Do you think a vendor is ever going to have an opportunity to, to take your concept and apply it nationally or, or maybe even globally? Who do you, who do you want to answer both that? Both of you, both of you, because I, I, I think at the same time. Well, <laughs> flip a coin. Okay, I'll I'll take it. I'll take the first cut at it. Oh, yeah. uh, the yes, I think it is happening, and the the binding things are, you know, Microsoft starting to think open and starting to make a lot of their stuff open, and people starting to use that uh, database and and. Uh, Probably Brad can name a whole bunch of other open databases, you know, and GitHub's and all kinds of things that the funny, funny things these kids talk about today. And the tools of their day are so different. And the young people are infiltrating the proprietary uh, vendors, and they very, very well understand why this needs to be open. And again, as I mentioned, we have this movement of Google and Amazon and Apple and all of these folks that have big databases and are, are, are able to do amazing things. So that's pushing it. And Smart City, I'm glad you mentioned that because Smart City is, is accelerating and the connection to, um, to building automation. And I think Smart City is going to smack them right on the nose because they're going to ask for open IT standards. They, they still, you know, they still kind of, BACnet is, is, uh, is good stuff for us to use within the buildings, but it's not, it's, you know, whether it's going to be, it's not going to be the, uh, the absolute bottom network of a smart city. It's going to be possibly one of the networks, but certainly not the lead network network. So anyway, I think that's that's sort of the direction that's going. Could you maybe fill in all the holes as you usually do, Brett? <laughs> um, okay, well, maybe I'll offer a bit of a, a different take on that. I mean, 
even today, we still interface our DDC systems with pneumatics. Like that, that is common and happens all the time. So it's not like oh, suddenly a, a brand new packaged, beautiful, perfect open system is going to swoop in and replace the established vendors. I mean, that, that's not going to happen. What's going to happen is little pieces are start going to start to be chipped away at it. So we may have an open archiving solution that starts to replace historians or, or things like that. We may start to use um, products to take the data up to the cloud, put it into an open database, then do analytics in the cloud rather than using um, you know, proprietary analytics solution. Um, we may start to do logic in the cloud and send that information back into the building, thereby starting to eliminate some of the proprietary control programming and sequence of operation that, that today lives in the controller. So it's gonna be little pieces that start to get chipped away that are replaced by something that's much more open. Um, I don't think it's gonna, it's not about, you know, coming in and totally displacing the vendors, but, you know, incrementally, there's gonna be shifts, I think, that start to eat well, away at some of the stuff that-, that Granted, you know, and I always appreciate that, you know, we, we gotta keep, you know, our feet on the ground and not get carried away with um, the swiftness of, of technology. Because it, it is fast, but it, it doesn't happen quite like that. But the, the thing that I'm thinking about is more in the specifications, you know, we're seeing, we saw some fabulous progress where we took our specifications of 23, 25, 26, or whatever, and we're starting to see this MSI, uh, you know, influence that comes in and providing general contractor style control over the integration of, of all the uh, operational technology and on the IT side. So they're bringing that prowess to bear. And we're seeing the most progressive en engineers that, uh, that I've come in contact, and Eric, correct me if I'm wrong, but we're just starting to see these engineers understand that concept. But what I think you're proposing and what Ken's saying too is that's not even swift enough. That's not fast enough for the real, the real uh, you know, pot of gold at the end, end of the rainbow. Ken, you were going to intervene? Yeah, yeah, I just want to make some points that are, that are quick and, and, and related to this. In our uh, January article, we have a great article by uh, Scott Cochran, which you guys know well. Uh, he's the third uh, opening speaker. Uh, it's Brad... Scott and myself are opening the open session, our opening session at AHR. And uh, he, his thing is that it's going to be bumpy. And uh, he, he's also saying that his MSIs, the, the greatest skill they have to learn is they basically have to learn the IT skills and they also have to provide those IT skills. So it's changing the industry and the people that are able to change in the industry are thriving. The people who are not changing, I'm not so sure what's going to happen to them. So I think that's, that's another thing. And again, those are just little increments. And then on the other side of the page, we've got uh, Calvin is writing uh, about the hardware and we've been pushing about back and forth a couple of emails and uh, this whole idea of these little uh, microcomputers, which of course I grew up in a time of microprocessors, and thought they were amazing. Microcomputers are even more amazing, smaller. They start to appear in everything. So he's basically talking about putting the laptop into an edge controller. So the whole thing is, uh, my next article is, uh, you know, the open road is going to be bumpy, edgy, but mindful. So I think that's, we got all these things going on. So there's a lot of transitions happening. Well, before we get to the mindfulness, which I think would be a, a, something we definitely want to talk about, um, I had a teacher once who said there are two types of change. There's a structural change and there's cyclical change. Cyclical change being like the stock market goes up and down, women's uh, you know, ties get skinnier or fatter. And your strategy in a cyclical change is you just wait until the cycle changes, right? You try to time the cycle. The structural change is like when the car was invented, it didn't matter how good a horse and buggy you had, at some point in time, you were going to be out, right? Uh, I think when the computer came around, it was just a matter of time before the, the, the typewriter went out. My question for you guys, vis-a-vis -vis smart building controls, do you think we're in the midst of a structural change or do you think this is more of a cyclical type thing? I think it's a structural change. I think it's uh, it's 
like I, I keep saying, it's 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 as significant as DDC. Yeah. That will, you know, like I grew up in the DDC era. Brad grew up, grew, he's growing up in the open era. And his, it's not, to him, it's not such a transition because he missed all of that other yeah. that 50 years of history. Uh, he comes into it and he just understands all the pieces that are around him and the best way to navigate his way through all those pieces is to use open software. And he knows how to do that because he's got his phone and he's got all these apps on him and he does all kinds of neat things at home. Why wouldn't I be able to do that for my client? And his client, when, when he's talking to his client, they're talking about the latest app and the thing that, what well, thing that really changed their life, you know? So yes, it's, it's definitely the, uh, the change, uh, that we're into right now, not, yeah. not cyclical at all. Well, and, and of course the, for our control trends community, uh, the cyclical change, you try to time the cycle structural change, you change or you die. That's so, it. Yep. So, so. Well, you know, there's um, some very interesting comments, but you know, I always try to come away with something uh, to summarize and, 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 and just what's been said so far here is we have, you know, change. We have agents of change. So we see specifications can change, uh, you know, what we're doing. Users, uh, you know, so specifications from the engineering community, the enlightened engineers, the, the users, the enlightened uh, users, the, the real calm educated users. Uh, we have new open thinkers uh, like like uh, Brad, who, who, who now takes the, the best, uh, you know, means available to get what needs to be done done uh, and uses the newest technology. Then you have the, uh, the IOT devices where you have technology that wasn't available or the, the, uh, the barriers of entry to that technology have been removed almost entirely. So it's available immediately. We're seeing a lot of young uh, or a lot of startup companies that are able to get to market so much faster than ever before. And then the vendor muscle seems to have diminished a little bit, you know, where they, they would, they would control the industry and rate of change by sunset and sunrise of products, you know? So the question I, I wanted to just kind of to summarize that thing is of those uh, agents of change and the percentage of their control or their rate to change, which one do you think out of those agents of change has the most influence now, uh, right now, 2019? Is that a, a question that you guys followed there or whatever? Ken, do you think, do you think the vendors still kind of control the rate of change or? No, I don't, I don't think so. And the other thing that I think we're all viewing ourselves wrong, you're, you're viewing yourself as products are important. We've fallen into the point that products have no, no significance at all because they change so rapidly. And uh, again, uh, Brad pointed that out in his last uh, interview that, that that, that's the reason why he wants to take some of this back into his consulting firm just to provide some stability to it because every project is completely different with complete equipment. But the big thing that we all have, everybody in on the four, four windows here, is it's all about people and uh, it, what uh, control trends, what uh, your supply companies are all about is it's about the people. And the fact that I can phone somebody and they can get me a product. And if they can't get me that product, they can get me this other product that is actually interchangeable and it works. And, and, uh, and for uh, Brad, it's the same thing as to get his people that can actually go out to a site and install one of these boxes and gather this data and then come back and look at it with their cell phone and route it over to a uh, database and then go back and show the client what they've done. Uh, that's, that's people. That's don't, yeah, see, don't focus uh, uh, on the technology. The technology, well, see, I, I would have significance. to, I would have to challenge that a little bit because, you know, to me, like uh, the industry, and the reason why I say this, Eric and I have just gone through some historical review of our industry and, and our hall of famers. And, and I remember the direct coupled actuator, the impact it made on our industry and how it removed modular motors literally from the equation. And even though that wasn't a great technology, it was the adoption rate now. So, and then we see some other uh, amazing uh, technology coming out like a, uh, uh, EZIO, for instance, came out with an FS32, so it's a quad-core processor, and it's now the fastest thing. And now everybody has followed some kind of a suit there where they've got an edge controller that has got a lot of things in, inherent to it. Uh, they've removed some of the hardness of the, the, the software 
engineering tools or whatever that used to be more expensive. So I agree with you that the people uh, are, are probably the most important aspect of the equation, but, but the IOT products and the, and the products that we have seen come into being here in the last four years from the product perspective have been the actual implementation of change because it become, it's become less expensive to get what Brad wants through the products. And, and, and uh, so I, I don't want to like, I'm not arguing. I'm just saying that I, I would say that I would put my rate of change or my, my chips on the fact that what has led to so much change to us has been the, the ability and the adoption of the technology that's available to make HTML5 a reality in, in our, our frameworks and stuff. It, it says that's, that's really what when we go through and look at the products 10 years ago and today, what an incredible sweep we've seen. I, I mean, what, what, I, uh, what I see happening, and I kind of agree, agree with everything that's being said here, but I, you know, from my perspective, you know, it looks like the barrier between kind of traditional IT technology and building controls technology, that, that barrier is dropping. And the products are more and more starting to look like one another. And I think the ultimate- well said. Yeah, yeah, I would, I would agree with that. Yeah, and I think the ultimate conclusion of that trend is that they, be, they become the same products. Um, and that you, you know, you've got plugins to do actuators and, you know, the, the physical end devices, of course, you still need, but mm -hmm. the hardware that does the computation, it's all the same. It's going to be the same. So, I mean, we're heading towards the commodification of that, like it is in the IT industry. I mean, at the end of the day, often you don't care if you buy an Intel processor or an AMD processor or, or whatever, right? You, you, you kind of buy what does the job the best and it's, the cheapest at that moment, and that may be a totally different answer next year. But um, well, just you know, a, last thing I'm going to say is because I'm I, Ken, I'm, I didn't mean to, to throw a sand in your in your in your wheel or gear there. What I meant was that your 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 themes in, in October and in, in, uh, November were about these out of IoT products that were they were sensational because it didn't need any permissions. You know, the, it was a permissionless development. But we saw in this year's control trends products that came out of other industries are now being used you know to the point where they they were the pro they were suggested to be the product of the year the IoT innovation and solution of the year somebody had the audacity to throw a, ros a, a raspberry pi in there i mean come on you know <laughs> then, a, then a bunch of people had the audacity to vote for it too so <laughs> that's what i mean so to me that means holy smokes this is for real right well and and, and I, th I think what makes this really hard for the traditional players is they have legacy products they have to support i mean it almost seems like it'd be easy easier to, to have an entry point into this now without a huge backlog of products that you have to support. So I think that's, that's a whole other thing that, that shifts it. But, and talking about shifting it. Just, just one, one yeah. thing, if I can wedge a point in here, is, okay, if we all believe everything and I very much believe what, uh, what Brad said is that the products are becoming, you can't tell the difference between, in fact, they're using, they're using a whole bunch of pro products that have nothing to do with our industry all altogether and but what that says that if our only resource is people then our people have to start thinking like IT people or a lot closer to the way IT people think and if you're able to make that transition and then carry forward all the experience you have with connecting to buildings I mean you guys all your people are so valuable. I think what's happening is is you guys are going through a stage where you're you're seeing the value of your products dropping, and this is kind of concerning you. But I think what you need to do is step back and say, as the price and the the amount of distribution we're going to do drops, the actual value of our people is going up because they actually understand all of these little pieces and which pieces fit where. And then as, as Brad said, we're, we're still connecting this stuff to pneumatic. So we'll be still connecting this stuff to the stuff you're selling for the next 20 years. So don't worry about that. But somebody that has the knowledge to do that and then in the middle of all of that, uh, say that, you know, really for this project, I'd recommend you buy one of those new IT devices. And, you know, you, you basically have a hook and a handle on that. But I think what you then start doing is you start charging for the time to come up with that kind of a solution. Brad's loving hearing that being a consulting engineer. We'll just start charging for the time instead of, <laughs> right? 
Yeah. Well, can you write? It's a business model that works, guys. Yeah. Well, and, and, and Scott Cochran's, uh, you know, he's his theme, and, and I read the the his article about the bumpy, uh, you know, times ahead. <laughs> I, I think I, this is the bumpy we're discussing. I think I think well, this is exactly what it, Scott's it, talking about. Is well, you know, this and, is going to be bumpy. Yeah. Well, and the reason why you know I, I get such a kick out of what we're doing here is because like we did the year in review kind of uh, you know a few uh, an episode back and and, uh, and 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 we're seeing how you know, the trends that used to be so high and, and so active, you know, all of a sudden it went off the table and new trends came in and emerging. And, you know, we had the, 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 the Amazon effect and we've gone through some, some very incredible, you know, uh, interesting trends that hit. And then we try to see, does this stick to the walls of our industry or is this just a pass through? Uh, we, we saw the managed services come up, you know, and become a very serious, uh, and, and people were actually doing, moving towards managed services, but they weren't calling it managed services. We saw the flattening architecture of, of you know, we used to have, you know, uh, when we pull out our product portfolio charts, you had you know, field level devices, you had supervisory devices, you had, you know, the, the server devices, and then you had, you know, your big, you know, big computer server thing, or now and so I go to cloud, but seeing that shrink down to the capability, these little tiny things have uh, IP addresses and they can talk to the web through the, the presence of Wi-Fi everywhere. And um, it has really changed some, some very, very, uh, you know, the, the most, the, some of the more lucrative aspects of that product portfolio have now been removed or they're commoditized to the point where the traditional folks have lost that business. And I agree with you 100%, Ken. You have to move into the knowledge aspect, but it's so different. It's so difficult to monetize that that most people haven't done it or can't do it or won't do it. And they, they just refuse to kind of budge. And they're the ones that are putting the headwinds up that we're trying to talk about right now. Right. Well, I, I, and I wanted to actually the, uh, my, my next article, uh, the, the, I was just fumbling around there to get to the last paragraph because the last para paragraph is about a word I'd never heard of called cervic cervication, cervication. Basically what it is, is uh, the, what do, let me read it. I, right I went to jail right. once for that. Smart, smart building, <laughs> smart building as a service <laughs> is what it is. So, uh, well, that, cool. well, well, listen, let, let, let's, let's, this has been great dialogue, and, and I want to get to some other things here. So speaking of people, let's shift to the people in the buildings, because, Ken, I think you really hit a trend early on. I think we're going to see it going into 2019 and beyond this whole digital mindfulness uh, concept. And, and for our community, sort of give them a brief overview of that, but I think you're really hitting on a trend. And then, Brad, I sort of like to get your perspective also on how you're seeing this show up with your clients. Are they asking for this? Is this something you see as a, a, a business opportunity to grow your business uh, type thing? Uh, you're asking about my clients or? No, 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 Brad, Brad's clients. Brad's clients, clients. okay, this good. This whole thing Brad, about the digital yeah. mindfulness that, that you sort of have, have laid out, Ken, I think you were the first one to sort of raise your hand and say, hey, Buildings are, tra are, are, are changing. They'd be more democratic. Yeah, specifically, when you went to that Nordic meeting and you came back, uh, Ken, you were, you were on fire with the, you know, the, the concept of a building. The, the, the whole idea of, of a relationship to the buildings changed. The, the building has emotions that we can, you know, and you were using the, the, the verb versus the noun, you know, about things. So I think, Eric, is that what you're getting at? Exactly. Know, a, okay. Yeah, actually, yeah, okay. So at the Nord, uh, <clears throat> the Helsinki, uh, Nordic, that's the word I'm looking for, Nordic building, uh, uh, smart building convention. I met... Uh, uh, Lawrence Arapo, right? Yeah. <laughs> Good job, Eric. You pulled that one out of a hat. Well, no, no. I was Damn. thinking, I was, I was thinking yeah. of Kent's article about him. because he Doc, talked about Dr. Him. Lawrence. Uh, Dr. Dr. Lawrence. Uh, Dr. L. Ap Apro. And anyway, so he was talking about digital mindfulness, and I... I got to admit actually he did an interview of me before we went to that thing and i got to admit i had no idea what he was talking about but uh yeah that, that what i typically call the helsinki head shake uh kind of opened my mind to a bunch of that stuff and he's actually just fine he's speaking with us in uh, atlanta and uh we he's just put together a uh, an article and it's called creating digital mindful spaces and uh, it's good. And he's, he's doing a lot of work with Google as well. And uh, he's incredibly busy right now. He's actually, after our session, he's, he's back and he's, uh, he leaves. 
he leaves us and he's, he has a, another appointment in Switzerland the next day. So uh, it's, his life is crazy. I'm not sure that he's actually uh, uh, bringing out the dream of his uh, digital mindfulness uh, in his own life. It sounds pretty torturous, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, but, he's, but he's, uh, he does point out that we need to, it, we need to bring this humanistic uh, side out and it's an excellent time to do it because we're changing everything sure. we're changing how we do business we're changing how we interface with the people we're allowing the people to have a relationship basically bring uh, bringing out their feelings uh, through social media and so it's a almost like a blank sheet so now we just have to shake our heads and think how can we do this with not annoying the people and basically supporting them and having these things make their life better? And that's that's a tough that's a tough task for us. But I think it, at least if we think about it, it's uh, it's something. Can can you kind of comment about the reality of that, like how how that might work or or not? <laughs> right. Me? Oh, okay. Um. Yeah, I mean, it, it's a tough one. It's something, I mean, I've been, um, you know, similarly, I, I, you know, I, I think the message that um, the Lawrence is promoting is, is bang on. Um, and you see, um, you know, you, you can see how technology is changing, how, how people interact. Um, again, the, you know, the industry is lagging and, you know, we see, we saw, you know, I think the first steps in this direction with, you know, products like Comfy, um, you know, that they very much are in this space. I mean, that, that's what they're trying to do is bring that human connection to the buildings. Now, I mean, they're, they're one product and, you know, fairly early to market. And I, I think we're going to start to see others. You know, I've, I've um, you know, connected with a couple of people who are working on developing, you know, software products that are kind of in, in the same space um, to allow you know, basically the people in the building to have, you know, better interactions and, and to provide value back to the building owners in the sense of, you know, okay, get a sense of how your people are feeling about your building and, and then try to actually put some, some numbers to that in terms of, you know, does this have an impact on our productivity to, you know, to provide something, you know, feelings are great, but I mean, we all know that at the end of the day, it's, it's dollars to make the world go round. Um, so if you can make that connection between that emotion and, and you know, what that means in terms of the bottom line for your business, then, well, maybe you can use that to justify actually doing something to improve the number of hot and cold complaints that you're getting in the building. If, if, you know, rather than just living with that situation, if you know that that's costing you know, $100,000 a year in lost productivity, well, suddenly there's, there's a lot more of a motivation to actually make an investment to, to correct that situation. Actually, the, the uh, one point I wanted to make was a point you made last year that stuck in my mind is you were talking about uh, the Vancouver transit system, I think, and you said, if the train is late, you don't bother calling the transit system, you just go on Twitter, and basically the people will tell you what the problem is, where the door is stuck, and where the where the car is, and so the transportation system has become people-driven. And I, I, that just stuck in my mind. And that's, I think that's where we're heading with the buildings is we want the buildings to be people driven. So when, when something happens that, uh, you know, a big box got left and is holding the elevator on the 15th floor and there's no elevator, we only are down to third elevator service that we immediately get that by the people who are running the building, uh, not, the fact that the maintenance guy actually notices that there's a big lineup of people. So, well, so that whole interaction I think is, is, is great. And I think you did a good job of, of uh, bringing that out in our discussions last year. Well, I remember uh, the collaboratorium you had, I'd say it was about three years ago at a HR and you were coming up with your, with some of these ideas and, and building metrics and lighting metrics were coming up and, and a lot of people were very slow. In fact, there was some people that said, you know, that's this metrics are meaningless or whatever, and it took a while. But I think the the idea that technology has allowed the occupants to communicate with the building automation system directly by by 
applications like comfy where you'd say I'm cold, I'm hot, I'm, I'm comfortable. That in turn leads to the most accurate uh, VAV zoning control. It gives you occupancy location. It gives you data that suddenly becomes important to somebody else that you really didn't think about in the first place. Not only does the occupant feel as though they've got a real meaningful attachment to the building or communication to the building through their technology, their smart device. Uh, I remember uh, I read a book about uh, this woman who who said the trees communicate and then a maple tree when it's infected by uh, you know insects or whatever it, it sounds the alarm to other trees that uh, it, it's, it's battling it, it produces chemicals that other trees uh, share information and she was laughed at and scoffed and these uh, scholars from Yale uh, these dendrologists said you know that's ridiculous or whatever and then 20 years later after she was you know basically you know scoffed at and, and lost her way in the industry they proved her correct and and I think some of the things that you've come out, Ken, was they're, they're not really controversial, but they seem so not far fetched. But they don't seem to have any well, yeah, immediate bearings. But they do, but and they're they going to and one and we're going to see very soon that more applications are going to take that that uh, that emotional aspect. I mean, architects have been doing it forever. We we did that series, Eric. Remember with uh, Frank Lloyd Wright, and he built this thing where you know architects tried to bring the outside inside, give people you know right. a place of comfort, you know, because the whole idea is productivity or, well, or you know, right. happiness. Ninety-two percent right. of your time's in a building. Right. Well, what 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 I hear Ken saying and and Brad, I, you too, is it is it's thinking about the building differently and thinking about the building as a platform that can connect people. Right, so that you can share that information to your point earlier, it makes everything more efficient. Is that a fair statement, Brad? I, I, yeah, I mean, I, I think Kenny hit it right on the head with you know, communication. It, it's about open and transparent communication. So suddenly things that were very hard to know in the past, you know, is on Twitter, and it's there for everyone to see. Uh, I, actually, another one that came up in uh, Helsinki was the concept of uh, deviceless interface and I kind of had to scratch my head as to what the heck they were talking about there and we're we're so orientated to pushing a button uh, uh, grabbing an app on our phone and to communicate with things but what they talked about is a mind a more mindful um, experience is one where there's no device involved and they said well where where would you have that when you would talk to the building and of course with uh you know google hey googles and amazon echoes we're now talking to the building turning lights on and and stuff but we can also talk to the building and tell us tell the building how we feel we could actually have a gripe section that we on a chat bot and start sending that stuff there and then uh <clears throat> calvin starts uh Started, started writing a little thing on machine vision and uh, I started scratching my head what the heck is that all about like I say what what these kids are thinking is just amazing and every one of them when I talk to them they tell me it's it's not not me it's what the kids that I'm I'm working with are thinking but anyway the machine vision is the whole idea that we uh, we put sensors in our edge devices that record video and uh, that becomes you know these every every phone has two three four five cameras in them they're so cheap they become cheaper than temperature sensors and uh, the uh, so we can actually put them in there once we do we can do analytics and we can actually see how many people are in the room how dark is the room do the people like the uh, shade I'm I'm fighting here. The sun's coming through my blind here and putting these uh, marks on my face, but uh, and I don't, I don't have a uh, deviceless thing that I can say, "Hey, drop the shade a little bit more." But you can kind of see see that whole relationship of of basically we now have devices that can start sensing some of the same things. That would have been a common a common thing if we had an edge device that was sitting here looking at me, as soon as it saw that, it said, ooh, that's not normal. I should turn the shade a little bit more and get right. that off his face or it's going to annoy him. That's right. the kind of, that's the kind of uh, digital mindfulness that is going to evolve in our industry. 
I think it's right on. And you guys, we're, we're right at 50 minutes, and it's been a great conversation. But before we end, uh, oh, I got one more too, Eric. We got and we got to give Brad one more credit. And that was the thing you did there with the uh, British ministry. Uh, tell us about that experience. Were you a little bit nervous when you were in front of those people, or was how how did that all happen? Was that a, yeah? Right? So, so uh, I guess you're you're referring to. I was recently in in front of the um, provides the, expert testimony to the Canadian House of Commons that a revolution in energy efficiency in existing buildings is achievable. I mean, that, that's yes. a noble, that's a mouthful, but I mean, that's going to be a throw, huh? Yeah, and basically, you know, the equivalent of going to before a, you know a committee of, of Congress or something like that is kind of our, our equivalent up here, and they're basically trying to set a national policy around energy efficiency and um, you know the economic impact of that on the country, and also how it contributes to Canada's climate change goals more broadly. So yeah, I, incredibly nervous. I've never done anything well, like that before. Congratulations. Yeah, that, that was very um, impressive. It was, yeah, it was, it was an interesting experience. And, and you know, I, I, I feel like I was able to deliver a, a good message around the fact that I think, you know, there is tremendous economic opportunity. In well, well done. Okay. And um, hopefully they listen to some of that and, and uh, we see the investment there. There certainly was a lot of, um, a lot of questions around you know, wanting to protect kind of the old economy too, and you know how does how does this impact on existing businesses, and what does that mean? But I, I think really the opportunity is growing new businesses out of this, and, and that there's tremendous cool. opportunity. Nice, so. nice. Well, boys, I tell you what, is we wind it down for our community. If you want more on these great topics, uh, hopefully you're coming to AHR in Atlanta, and if you are, both uh, Brad and Ken Sinclair have sessions that they'll be hosting. So, fellas, as we round this out, uh, Brad, why don't we start with you? What session are you going to be at? What day and time? And then, Ken, you're doing several. Let's tell our community about uh, how they can get more information. Yeah, so I'm doing – I'll be in three sessions. Uh, two are with Ken, uh, and one is uh, Scott already – or, sorry, it's Ken already alluded to with uh, Scott Cochran on our opening session, and that'll be on Monday. Uh, and then on Tuesday, we've got um, in the morning, it's another session with uh, an, on the, uh, the emotion of buildings. And that's together again, another session with Ken and uh, Therese Sullivan from uh, Tritium. Uh, and then the afternoon on Tuesday, around noon hour, I've got another session with um, and this is a, a particular interest maybe to this crowd is on open, open hardware and open software. Uh, and I'm moderating that session. We've got a really interesting panel. We've got um, Calvin from ACCS, uh, Zach uh, Nestoff from Contemporary Controls, and uh, Nicholas Wern, who's from a Swedish company called Go IoT. It's a really good combination of consultants and product manufacturers and integrators. I think it's going to be a really great conversation. Sounds great. Sounds great for sure. What about you, Ken Sinclair? What do you got going on? Okay. Well, like as, as uh, Brad mentioned, we open up with Scott Cochran, uh, a favorite of yours as well. And uh, the three of us talk about the future of building automation and uh, creating our new persona, building the motion. And then uh, this is, is that, actually, is that a, Monday, I find, sorry. Is that on Monday? That's Monday. Yep. Yeah. Monday at uh, nine o'clock. Okay. Uh, okay, then uh, the 14th, January 14th. And then we've got uh, two education sessions. Uh, actually, uh, the first one is an introduction to building automation systems. Uh, Kimberly Brown and uh, Scott Cochran. So, I mean, that's pretty, pretty high, uh, high, high grade folks to get you involved in automation. And Kim, who sets up the uh, AHR, these were her requests. Uh, she said, "How do people, how do people learn how to talk funny like you?" And uh, uh, you know, and we really, we all struggle with education, and Brad struggles with education of his people, and uh, so. But she wanted to have something that people could come across the floor. I'm an electrician, and I want to learn how to get into building automation. So anyway, that's an introductory course they've got going. And uh, then we've got our old friend, uh, uh, Scott uh, Bowen, yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's, uh, he's doing a building automation. It's kind of picks up and gets a little bit more into, you know, more of the analytics and some stuff like that. You can imagine with a, a tritium background what it's going to be. 
And then we've got uh, this one with Lawrence, uh, Dr. Lawrence, uh, smart environments for humans. And uh, if you have time, I would really like you to read the article. I've been pushing them for this article for the last two, three months, and it finally got done. Uh, and it's worth uh, worth a read because you can yeah. kind of get an insight as to what he's going to talk about. And uh, Lawrence is doing some amazing stuff. He's working with Google right now, and uh, they're, they're starting to uh, – get a hold of this digital mindfulness. He's he's in a, a very hot space right now. There's a lot of people are sort of, oh, yes. You know, if, even if you just listen to the words and, and use your own interpretation of what you think digital mindfulness might be, it's probably better than what you're doing. Right. Well, we had, we had him on the show, interviewed him. He's very articulate, a fascinating individual. So there's actually a uh, video interview we did with Dr. Lawrence. He's great. I read the article, Ken. You're absolutely right. It's jam on. Yeah. And uh, I, I tell you what, I can't tell you guys how much we appreciate you coming on the show. Ken Sinclair, automatedbuildings.com. The January issue's out. Check it out. Check him out at AHR. Brad White, sesconsulting.com. Is that the best website? That's right. Yep. For you guys. Guys, thanks so much for taking some time to be on the show. Thanks, guys. <clears throat> All right. Well, good stuff again from uh, Ken and Brad. Uh, look forward to seeing you guys. Uh, we probably won't have a show next week because we'll be doing the Control Trends Wars that Sunday night. So we appreciate you tuning in. Again, special thanks to our guest, Brad White and Ken Sinclair. So, Kenny, remember, be bold, stay in control, and it's 2019. So if you're not staying relevant yet, it might be too late. Indeed, Eric. Indeed, Kenny Smyers.